Good evening. Welcome to Conservation Conversations presented by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. My name is Kevin Kelly and I'm joined tonight by uh, my co-host, trusty co-host, Gabe Jenkins. Gabe, it's good to see you again. How are you? Good, Kevin. How about yourself this evening, sir? Doing great. Doing great. So I'm really excited. Uh, you know, spring is in full bloom and, uh, you know, our past couple shows have talked about really focused on spring fishing and preparing for fishing success. Now it's time to talk a little hunting, time to talk a little turkey, right? Absolutely. Uh, tonight's topic, we're definitely going to talk turkey. We've had a little bit of turkey introduction across the state already with the kiddos getting after them last weekend. Uh, so now as we move into the, the, uh, the regular turkey season here in a couple of weeks, really we want to focus on turkey hunting, resources available, and just kind of all things turkey this afternoon and this evening. So who do we have joining us tonight? So tonight we have two different guests uh, with us, uh, Zach Danks. Uh, he is the turkey coordinator within the wildlife division and Sergeant Brian Dolan of the fourth district. Um, we're excited to have these guys on uh, tonight. And if we could, we'll just let uh, both Zach and Sergeant Dolan just uh, say hi and give us a little bit of information about themselves and uh, kind of why they're here and what they enjoy. Hey folks, uh, Kevin and Gabe, thanks for having us. Um, thanks for being here, Zach. Yeah, Zach. Excited to talk with folks tonight and have a conversation. And uh, I, I'm the turkey program coordinator. I also handle rough grouse. Uh, been in this position for about five years now. Really fortunate. Been with the department 13. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a really exciting role. I've loved turkey since I was a, since I was a teenager. Got my first bird and I think it was 97, my spring of my freshman year of high school. So I've been pretty excited about it ever since. So uh, anyways, and glad to have Brian on here. Uh, Sergeant Dolan, really important what the conservation officers do for us, helping to protect the resource too. So glad to be on with him. Well, Zach, before we get to Sergeant Dolan, I, I first just want to thank you. I know you've uh, been a pretty busy guy here lately. I've seen you on a lot of stuff over the last couple of weeks and this week in particular talking about turkeys. Um, so we're going to pick your brain a little bit more tonight and uh, try to glean a bunch of information uh, from you as well. So thank you uh, for being on here. Sergeant Dolan, thank you uh, as well for being here. Um, and just uh, kind of give us a little bit about yourself and what you enjoy and your history with the department, sir. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, and you all can call me Brian. Uh, um, I've been with the department. I mean, you've worked together a lot, Gabe, throughout the years, but... Uh, been with the agency for 13 years, law enforcement for nine. Uh, really enjoy what I do. Um, it's something I've, I've wanted to do since I was a little kid. Been very fortunate to actually have the opportunity to work for one of the best agencies in the state. Um, so I look forward to the show um, and answering everyone's questions and, and trying to educate as far as turkey season and talking turkey. Brian, for our, for our watchers, you're fourth district, right? So can you kind of give us uh, where that, that is in the state for mm -hmm. folks that might not be familiar with our law enforcement districts? Uh, yes, I, I'm down in uh, kind of south central uh, part of the state, um, basically right on the Tennessee line. You know, I cover, I'm assigned primarily work Cumberland County, but, <clears throat> but we go all the way up to Wash north of Washington County. Uh, west over to uh, uh, Marion County, Barron, uh, Edmondson County, um, and pretty much the furthest east we got is Adair, Taylor. Um, it's just one big circle, pretty much. Gotcha. And you're not just an officer, but you're a turkey hunter as well, right? I've been all my life, uh, ever since uh, I was old enough to hold a gun, my, my dad got me into hunting, started with small game and worked in the turkeys. So um, I actually grew up hunting Tennessee before I started hunting Kentucky. So, Oh, we won't hold that against you tonight, but you know, we're glad to learn something from you for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, before, we, before we kind of dive in, we're going to uh, just want to remind everybody who's watching uh, this evening that you know, we'll be taking questions. Um, so please go ahead and ask, you know, if you have a question, go ahead and ask it in the chat um, on the, uh, off to the side there, and we'll try to get to them at the, at the end of the episode. Well, sounds good. Um, 
Gentlemen, thanks again for coming on. And first off, Sergeant Nolan, we'll be back with you in a little bit and we'll kick things off with Zach. Um, and let's, let's talk about turkeys. Let's talk about the turkey story of Kentucky. Kind of, you know, we know what the status is now, but let's, let's, let's talk about the restoration or, and what we used to have. And it's kind of paint the picture of the history of our turkey program here in Kentucky, if you don't mind. Absolutely, Gabe. Uh, relish that opportunity, man, because this is a precious resource and uh, we don't remember the past. Uh, we might take for granted this, this great critter in our state. So happy to talk about it. Uh, I will say, like I alluded to, I think it was 97 when I got my first bird. And it's pretty neat because my dad had, had been chasing them a few years before that, but not much longer. So we kind of got to learn to hunt them together, you know. And I just I think back about it because when I started hunting them, there were quite a few birds. And, there were, you know, it's like I kind of poofed into there being a lot of turkeys on the landscape. But it wasn't very long before that, just in my lifetime, that there were very, very few turkeys. Um, so it's, uh, it's definitely neat to talk about the specifics of it and uh, uh, you know one there's one guy in particular that was spearheaded at all it's a man named George Wright he was my uh, predecessor for being a turkey program coordinator for the state of Kentucky the first one and really the architect of, of the turkey restoration success story along with all the other agency folks and volunteers and WTF members that he helped to uh, you know marshal for the effort so well, I know we have some slides prepared, so I'll pull that up and we'll just kind of let you go at your pace, Zach, tonight and just uh, walk us through turkey, wild turkeys in Kentucky. Sounds great, Gabe. Feel free to interrupt me, ask me questions or things. I don't want this to be like a lecture. It's just informative conversation. So, right. Uh, all right. So restoration in Kentucky. Uh, all right. So, so folks are familiar with land between the lakes, uh, but right around the, uh, Right after World War II, the guys in this picture here, these are some more of our predecessors. A guy named Fred Hardy is holding the bird there. Um, he was a researcher for the department. At that time, uh, it wasn't even called Land Between the Lakes. It was uh, Between the Rivers National Wildlife Refuge, uh, or Kentucky Woodlands National Wildlife Refuge. I apologize, I think the official name. That's really the only place in Kentucky where there were wild turkeys left. Uh, because Kentuckians knew how to shoot and we did a good job wiping them out across the state as we, uh, you know, changed the landscape with our settlement. Um, so it was uh, really around that time that there was interest in getting turkeys back across the state. And so we actually moved over this, you know, from the 40s, 50s, early 60s, you see there, we, we moved over 300 birds from what is now LBL East on some WMAs in Eastern Kentucky. And uh, unfortunately, that really did not result in successes. It didn't help establish populations like we were hoping. Uh, in 1954, the year my dad was born, again, just for perspective, because we may have some folks uh, around that age group here, there, there were fewer than a thousand birds in the entire state. So uh, it just kind of gives you a picture. And then again, fast forward to the late 70s, we kicked it into high gear and and just you know before we did other states were really ramping it up it was really the 70s when lots of states started moving turkeys around there were only a few states that had viable populations really missouri is a big one uh, they were a source state for a lot of us uh, but but we got turkeys from several of these states as you can see here over 4300 from out of out of state over this 20-year period and it really took that sustained period of getting birds from out of state. And then 81, the year I was born, we had enough birds in Kentucky that we could start to trap birds and move them within the state and get, get local populations going, you know. At the same time, we were getting birds from out of state. So it was really this multi-pronged effort. And so in total over this time frame, we, you know, it was over 6,700 birds moved around. And that was the that was the seed, if you will, for the population that we saw in later years and, and have today. Zach, did you, um, of those turkeys that came from all those other states, you know what state was the driver and the main contribution? Was it Missouri? 
I, I think Missouri was a big one. And I, this is okay. from hearing from my counterpart, Turkey biologist in other state states uh, right next door in Indiana. We have uh, Steve Bax. He's been doing this job for a, a long time. Yeah. And, you know, Steve from, from yep. meetings and things too. And, and he talked about how, uh, you know, a lot of states got their birds from, from Missouri. Uh, I, I kind of think that a lot of those birds remained in the area where the elk are now. And, and you gave were instrumental in helping Missouri get their elk population going mm -hmm. with the uh, down in the Ozarks and the Pe at Peck ranches. That's right. Yeah. And I, I think that was a source of turkeys for many states. Well, I know. Oh, okay. sorry. I think it's important, you know, it's really important to point out that some, I mean, the restoration of these species, it's not just Kentucky acting on its own, but I mean, you look at all the states that, that participated in, in, in Kentucky, you know, Kentucky helped um, Missouri out, um, you know, Mississippi helped Kentucky out. It, it, it would just all worked in kind of tandem and it's really fascinating. And it, it wasn't just turkeys, you right. know, it's, it's, Gabe, you can speak to the elk and, and I know we have before, but uh, it's really remarkable partnerships uh, between the states and, and various partners that, that helps make something like this happen which is extraordinary you know it's it's hard to really think about in our generation I mean, we didn't have to do this except for elk that's the the new thing but i mean turkeys deer otters uh, all those went through a very similar story from non-existence completely extirpated uh you know turkeys are very similar to the whitetail and that they uh whitetail we didn't have any except for a few that were at lbl so it shows the importance of land between the lakes and how vital it was to our, our natural history of our resources uh, that they were able to sustain themselves enough to grow and populate. And then we use them as source stock, um, you know, through the 50s, 60s and 70s. So a uh, pretty neat story for sure. For sure, yeah. All right, Zach, so we'll uh, kind of, you, you mentioned George Wright a little bit. Um, you, you, he was the first turkey coordinator, correct? He was, yeah. And I, I call him St. George, and I mean that wholeheartedly. The guy was a, I mean, he was a great biologist. He studied the, the birds at LBL back, you know, uh, back in the uh, 70s, early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And he noticed problems with that flock. There were so few numbers that genetics were really bottlenecked at that point. And that's probably why those early efforts to move these birds from LBL to other places it didn't really take, you know. It took getting birds from out of state. He saw that. He was an ardent turkey hunter. And so he really blended hunting passion with, uh, you know, his interest to learn more about critters through biology. Uh, served in the Navy, too. I mean, just a great guy. So I hear I did not have the good fortune to know him. But several of our, our staff that still work for us worked under him and knew him. And, you know, I'm sure they all have stories. Plenty of hunters I talked to knew him and uh, spent time with him. And so he's just a great ambassador for the resource. So I always try to give him his due, you know, a tip of the hat kind of thing. So, so when you, when you work at this department, that's one of the names you hear often, you know, I can, I can attest to that. So. Definitely. And this slide here is just kind of showing that these, these orange bars are the numbers of birds released from the late seventies through the late nineties over this period. And you can see the number, exact numbers vary year to year. Uh, there were some real high years, um, but, but a lot of birds put out across the state. And then that gray line is basically showing how the turkey population was growing right along with, with these uh, releases, right? Because again, you've got, you got birds being dumped out on the landscape and we, got, we have pretty favorable landscape. Kentucky's got a great mix of woods, pastures, uh, crop fields and uh, all this stuff comes together for a pretty favorable landscape. And, and so these turkeys were reproducing and reproducing. You had genetics from several states. And so it, uh, it, was, it was rocking again, right up to that 97 period, I think when I got my first bird. So again, it's just neat to put it in perspective. So looking to today, kind of how things are currently, um, you know, I get asked a lot, how many turkeys do we have? What's the population? You know, this is hunters, this is outdoor writers. Uh, I myself wonder, I, I love thinking about this stuff. But the thing that's hard to convey to people is that, 
you know, this is not something we can be real certain about. Gabe, you know it as well as anybody from your years working on big game. We have an idea, uh, and this is largely based on our harvest, but, you know, it's not real easy to say exactly. There's a lot of uncertainty, big range here that it could fall in. And that's important uh, mainly because, you know, when we think about making changes to regulations, it's real important to keep in mind that uh, you need to kind of look at the trends and there is uncertainty here. So if we make one change, whether that's to allow two birds shot in a day or lengthening the season or moving it early, all these things have implications, right? And some of them, we, we have an idea of what those implications may be. And in other ways, we don't. So uh, if we want to protect the resource, we got to be kind of careful. And, and I, I'm just trying to show here with this uncertainty, we, we you know, there's, there's a lot of wiggle room. But all that said, we have a healthy turkey flock. Uh, it's It kind of bebops up and down in, in the last 10, 15 years. But uh, it's not growing by leaps and bounds like it was. But it's still a healthy flock across the state. And, and here, just showing this is the actual tail check harvest total. So, uh, you know, your eyes naturally probably go to the peak, and that was in 2010. And uh, I'll get to that in just a minute, kind of to uh, can touch on why that may have been. But you can see how we, we uh, before that point, we hadn't broken 30,000. And then after that, we kind of rode around that 30,000 mark for a while, and we kind of dipped, and it's like we're riding a little wave. You know, you can see that in the last in the last eight, 10 years or so. So still still healthy uh, numbers. We've kind of, that 30,000 mark has become sort of like a de facto line for us all to, you know, want, hope that we attain. So it's, it's neat to see the patterns. And, and I'll just quick, quick shout out, these are telecheck harvest numbers. And so it's really neat how the sportsmen have complied with regs and have done telecheck because what it's meant for us is we have a pretty reliable data source. Yeah. And a lot of states don't have this. Gabe, you know it. They don't have it even for deer. Uh, so, and some states are, have gotten it going in recent years or are trying to get it going. And it's not a panacea, but it's a great source of information. So just another reason for hunters to to be diligent with their telecheck. No, I've got a, I've got a plug as, as Kentuckians, uh, both uh, as the ones that live here and then also the folks that come and enjoy our hunting hunting activities we are very blessed. You know, we have fantastic uh, data, the data sets to be able to manage these species correctly. And I mean, you, you talked about this the telecheck data and the harvest, and we're going to get into some other things that we do, that you do as a, as far as managing the turkey population goes, but lots of states don't have that. And we are the eye of envy to a lot. And that's important to know is we've got it pretty good. Uh, some of us might not realize it sometimes if, if you're not uh, fortunate enough to potentially travel to some other states, but we're very blessed as biologists and managers to have information at our fingertips to you know, make wise decisions and make wise recommendations. So let's uh, kind of you know, talk. We talked a little bit about opportunity. So this is uh, let's break down the harvest. Where uh, where do most of these turkeys come from that are harvested, Zach? Yeah, well, we've got birds in every county. Good hunting opportunities in every county. Of course, you know, going east to west, you know. There, there's lighter harvest in the east, but my goodness, if, if you are from there or spend any time there, you know, you, you probably got one leg shorter than the other. That's the joke, right? It's steep and uh, it's, it's beautiful country, but it can, be, it can be tough, you know, unless you've done your homework and know where the birds are. So some of this uh, is, is more a reflection of just how hard it is to hunt this, you know, this, this turf. Uh, but perhaps, you know, maybe bird populations aren't as strong there simply because there's a lot of forest. As you move west, and again, you get into that mixture of land cover. You know, as turkey, turkey uh, biologist hunters, you know, most of us know that turkeys really thrive both in the woods and in the open, open ground, but it's really that kind of interface between the two that's important. And you see more of that in kind of that central, central west, uh, western Kentucky there. And so those counties with the darker shade, they, they you know, like, like you see there, they uh, harvest more in those counties, but uh, I'm not showing it here. Another way you could look at it is like harvest per square mile. And, and so that would change the coloration a little bit. We harvest a lot of birds in Northern Kentucky uh, in, in the, 
those counties are smaller. So, yeah. you know, the shading would change a little bit, but all that to say that, you know, probably all things being equal, there's, you know, that green river region is going to probably always be our stronghold for turkeys just because it's a great landscape for them. All right. So I lost my screen share here. Sorry about that. There we go. So talk to us a little bit about kind of the current status. We've covered some of the population stuff. So, uh, right. So, so this slide is kind of meant, uh, I'm meaning it to get to what I'm hearing from hunters. You know, every year I've been in this position, I've heard from hunters and, and probably our field biologists hear from them. You know, something's going on. People are starting to think something's up. There's not as many turkeys as there were a few years ago. People are sensing that, perceiving it. And there's some truth in it. And, and why might that be, you know, this trouble in paradise, I, I kind of call it, is it trouble? We don't really know exactly, but, but the that slide that was up there just then was kind of meaning, uh, it, it was showing how across the Southeast, I've got several, those graphs were of several the Southeastern states, but it's really true in the Northeast and the Midwest that what we're seeing is, is uh, worse reproduction. Uh, some of the, the seasoned hunters know that we track poults per hen with a brood survey, and uh, and that's that's kind of our, our main way to track reproduction. And it just doesn't seem like we're pumping out as many baby turkeys as, as we used to. And why might that be? Well, there's potentially a lot of reasons, but uh, and we can debate on it. Folks have their pet reasons. Everybody loves to blame a coyote, uh, and coyotes do do take their share of turkeys, but it's it you know. There's, there's other factors at play. Uh, habitat is a huge one. And then of course we biologists like to point out the weather. You know, when you get big floods in late May and June, you're, you are, you know, setting those poults up for some, some, for some hypothermia and just, just having a hard go of it. So well, it's just striking though, that all several states are, are seeing the same kind of trends. Um, so again, there's potentially very many factors and I'm happy to go into the theories and talk about the relative merits of each one, but uh, go to, <laughs> we get, we get real deep tonight, right? You want to do right, something. as much as you want to. Yeah. <laughs> but, level, so. I don't know if you touched on it, but like if we have a really wet spring, early summer, that yeah. can also have an impact. Right. And, and we have seen that, you know, in, in oh, recent years. But, yeah, for sure. Kevin, I mean, that's, again, a lot of hunters, seasoned hunters know this, but it's not something that maybe a casual hunter thinks about. I mean, when turkey season is over in mid-May, you know, they're happy they got their bird or, or whatever, but they're, they're moving on to, to other pursuits, going fishing or t-ball games or whatever you got going on. But that period is what, what I think about a lot, because if you get some cold, sustained rain uh, during that period when hens are on the nest or, or particularly when the first broods are hatching man it can be it can be detrimental because those little poults are covered in down you know they until they molt their first set of feathers several weeks in they're, they're really susceptible uh luckily that hen i mean she can brood those poults you know her stick out six out her wings and, and they hide up under her right and she does her best to keep them dry but even if they met, even if they make it through that first couple of weeks, as they start getting bigger, like quail sized, well, they can't all fit under there, assuming that a lot of them are still alive. So then they're, they still haven't molted into these real protective feathers that they need uh, to shed that rain uh, well. So, so there's, again, they're susceptible. And all the while, everything likes to eat baby turkey. You know, bobcats are a, a specialist for turkey. I mean, there's a reason that our, our UK wildcats are have the bobcat mascot they're amazing predators and uh you know we can talk about predators in a bad light but they're amazing they're part of nature and turkeys are adapted to them you know so just because bobcats are you know there's more bobcats now and they probably take some turkeys uh it doesn't mean they're like the reason that we're seeing all these declines all at once uh, again it's probably a combination of factors and and so if you get those ill-timed rains it's it's, it's just not a good thing. So that's, well, uh, that's a big culprit for me. So let's segue into, I mean, we've talked a little bit about it. I've got the graph up here depicting right. reproduction in Kentucky, right? Kind of yeah, what so real quickly here, back in the 80s, we started this survey back in 84. Staff and volunteers, largely NWTF members, they, they watch for 
turkeys during July and August. Specifically, we're looking for broods and we count the number of poults in relation to hens. And you can see the trend from the 80s into the early 2000s was pretty not good. If you drew a line through those points, it would be downward. Uh, we have sort of leveled off since about 04 in there. You know, the line is a little flatter. It's still kind of pointing downward though, and, and we are concerned about that. Now hit, hit advance, Gabe, and this will segue us in. Uh, okay, go back, yep, so right there. All right, so that's 2008. So if you, you know, remember back to 2008, if you were in the state then or uh, paying attention to live, whatever, that year, man, something happened in our turkey reproduction. <laughs> we saw a lot more and uh, Gabe's laughing because I know he's a big turkey hunter and he connect the dots. Um, and, and so it cicadas. And this is, this is a prescient right now because uh, some people probably have heard this is a, is a cicada year. And I'll talk about that in a second, but these cicadas are a super protein source for these little guys, poults as they're growing. But it also alleviates some of the predation pressure on poults because that hungry coyote and bobcat and anything else, coons, uh, snakes, everything that would eat a turkey potentially has another prey source to switch to. Okay. Not to mention that the hen doesn't have to move her brood as far to, for them to find food. And so they're probably a little less susceptible. So all those can, under certain conditions, combine for a good hatch. And, and like we saw in that previous slide there of that graph at 2008, it was like a shot in the arm those cicadas provided. So, uh, you know, it's a real neat phenomenon. Now keep in mind, we have annual cicadas on the left there that occur every year, uh, but they're not the same critter as these periodical cicadas. These are just a phenomena in nature. There's what we call broods of them. And some of them are every 13 years and some of them are every 17 years and they occur all over the country. Next slide, Gabe, real quick. I'll show you, or actually I get ahead of myself. Well, this, this table is from UK. They're entomology folks. And so you see there's different years and then brood, that, that's not turkey broods. This is broods of periodical cicadas. Again, they occur geographically and they all kind of are named. And basically you can see that top row, hit, it, hit your arrow there, Gabe. Uh, so, so basically this year, there's not a lot of potential for this cicada brood to, to really show up in Kentucky. If we see it, it'll be along either the Tennessee border or the Ohio River counties, you know, either from up around Burlington, even all the potentially down to like Owensboro. But based on past hatches or emergences of these cicadas, it's just not real, they're not real prevalent in Kentucky. But look a couple rows down there, uh, 2025. That's the biggie year, okay? That's gonna be brood 14. And that's where most of the state, except the West, far west purchase region is gonna see it. Okay, next slide, Gabe. Uh, this map here, you can see, these are, these are the different broods of periodical cicada across the, the country. Uh, and, and we're smack in the middle and it's pretty neat. Uh, hit your, hit your uh, arrow one time there, Gabe, or you've got your thing there, that's, that's fine. Kentucky, clearly we have light green and dark green. That light green that he's showing, uh, that is uh, brood 14. That's the one that's gonna emerge in 2025. All that yellow there that you see in Indiana and in Ohio, that's the brood that's hatching this year, brood 10, brood X, okay? And so it's not even really showing up in Kentucky and there's some down in East Tennessee. So it's, it's not really a, probably gonna be a big factor here, but again, just need to wait a little bit, be patient, and it'll, it'll pop up. And then the purchase region has their own. The, the one most likely to, to help them out or be seen down there is the 13-year the brood. It's like 23, that very last one on that legend there. But uh, it's just interesting to me. It's real fascinating. This is not something I even learned in school. It was really only from hunting and, and reading, you know, reading about it and, and encountering it as a biologist that, you know, start to put these these things together so i hope people take advantage of just the chance to observe nature out there this year so if you are along those for example those ohio river counties maybe let us know if you're seeing cicadas you know it'd be kind of neat to track them but. so we've talked a little bit about history uh the restoration projects and things that we're expecting in the future with cicadas and what kind of drives uh the population you know, we talked about harvest and modeling. Um, talk to us about some of the research. So for folks that follow our agency, they've seen some things. 
uh, from the turkey program on some new uh, proposals and stuff you're getting ready to endeavor. Um, talk to us a little bit about that, if you don't mind, Zach. Sure. Uh, advance on a little bit there, Gabe. Uh, yeah, so I just had another, that's just a repeat slide, just to okay. emphasize that here. Okay, so so for the research, uh, we the commission uh, just fortunately just approved a project that we have proposed. This is a statewide turkey banding project. So uh, we actually are piggybacking on a project that Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency has, has undertaken with Tennessee Tech University uh, down in Cookville. Okay, they, they got a great researcher down there program and the, the my counterpart uh, biologist there at TWRA, they launched this project. The goal really is all across Tennessee to estimate harvest rates of turkeys. And, and so we wanna do the same thing in Kentucky. So, so what's harvest rate? That just means that for however how many gobblers there are out there across the landscape, gobblers and jakes, you know, there's some proportion of them that get harvested, right? And that's a hard number to, to get at. Now, duck hunters, you know, they, they relish the chance to shoot a banded duck, right? Uh, well, the duck world, they and our staff across the state, they capture wood ducks every year and band them. It's, it's turkeys are bigger. They're a tough critter to catch. Uh, so it takes a lot of time and effort, but we're going to attempt it. We're going to try to do it in all regions of the state, not everywhere, but try to get representation for all the regions. We're going to need some, some cooperative landowners, and I know that we've got them. Uh, we got some great NWTF helpers, too, and uh, board members that are already helping us out there. Uh, hopefully we get an S, uh, sort of a handle on this harvest rate thing because the main thing we don't want to do, uh, we don't want to over harvest birds because this is the one thing we can control. We can't control the weather Kevin talked about. We can't, can, you know, it's hard to control predators. It's, uh, you know, we, we in, try to get folks to provide good habitat, but we don't directly control a lot of it. Uh, so, Besides enforcing the, the regulations that are in laws that our COs do, that very important job. The other thing is, is setting, setting our regulations. And so we want to make sure and, and basically assess our, our regulations and, and how much we're harvesting them. And we're going to compare the information we get with our reproduction data that we just talked about. And then while we've get, got these birds, we're going to take the opportunity to gather some samples, blood, uh, fecal samples, all these kind of, you know, the, the dirty kind of stuff that that we will uh we've got a great vet on our for our agency wildlife veterinarian and she's going to help spearhead this for us get us some information because we get a lot of questions about disease you know you know is that having an impact on on turkeys and so there are some emerging diseases and that we want to keep tabs on and so this is a great way to do it it's a pretty ambitious effort but i know our staff are up for it and and the, the sportsmen across the state will probably be interested in the results so i'm pretty excited about it oh. Very uh, a neat project. So that's really the efforts that we're getting ready to un undertake. But we've got a lot of passionate landowners, passionate turkey hunters. They want to get involved too. And that's the cool part about the turkey program is you have those needs. You work with our hunters. You work with our landowners to better manage the, the population. Uh, some of these are fairly new to, I think, to a lot of the people. We want to really showcase that. Um, so if, if you don't mind, just kind of wrap us up with how, how our folks can get involved to help manage the population. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's a great segue because with the Bandit Project, obviously that's hunters reporting with if they were to shoot a banded bird. But there are other ways, you know, and again, like Gabe said, important stuff. This brood survey that we talked about, I know I'm probably boring you with, with graphs and numbers, but, you know, if you're a kid and you're in school, just realize that what your teachers are teaching you is for a reason, right? Because <laughs> I use it every day. Uh, these little numbers, you see, this is a, this is a line graph, but you got these little bracket like things. What that's meant to show is the uncertainty in the numbers that we have. Again, I talk about that a lot, but if we get great public participation, the more reports we get of turkeys, the more confidence we can have, and we can tighten up those intervals and be more confident in the numbers that we get. And, you know, so it's, again, it comes down to folks participating, uh, in it. And so that's, that's one way they can help. Uh, next one, Gabe, we should have a couple other there. Hunter surveys. So this past year, actually last couple of years, we've, I've been trying to survey hunters. So what we do is after, as soon as season wraps up, I draw a random sample of hunters, okay? 
And those hunters get mailed or emailed a survey. And, and many of them, over 2,500 of them, uh, responded to that survey this past year. And the reason this is important is because it allows us to get information that hunters are, are interested in. You know, I, I used to get asked, what's the success rate, you know, uh, of, of hunters in Kentucky? And I didn't have a number for them. It takes surveys like this to do it. And the willingness of sportsmen to, uh, to, to provide that information and help us out. And so I was able to get an estimate, 36%, you know, and compared to some other states and given all the uncertainty with Turkey, that's, that's a pretty good number right now. And so you actually see with this graph here, there's a lot of folks that unfortunately aren't successful in terms of harvesting the bird. But, and, and I'm one of those quite recently, because <laughs> often I'm taking a, a, a new hunter or, or I'm hunting with my bow, but I still consider it successful, but it's still helpful to know how many people, you know, didn't get a bird, how many got one, how many got two. So this is like extra information on top of the telecheck information we talked about earlier. But with that telecheck uh, information, you know, if you check your bird online, which as you see on the left here, the number of people that are checking their bird online is, is going up over time. And they're providing us with information because they're telling us how many days it took them to harvest the bird, right? So common sense, if it takes you longer to kill a bird than it did last year, that might mean there are fewer birds on the landscape, right? So this is, this is one way I'm trying to track hunter effort. We also do it with that hunter survey, but it's sort of a, a quick and easy way to take advantage of the information that hunters provide when they telecheck. So yet another reason to, to fulfill your telecheck stuff. So thanks guys for, for bearing with me on those, on those graphs and, and numbers and things, but I definitely try to get folks to understand how important they are as sportsmen for conservation. So, so absolutely. Um, and, and I mean, you're, you're taking steps, you know, with the support of, um, um, other staff, the commission, to get answers to some of those common questions that, that you have gotten. And it's, you know, as, as hunters, you know, you, you help uh, just by, by purchasing a license and a permit, but also by participating and, and uh, you know, helping out with these surveys, you know, as you can, as you've heard, it's, it's just really important to the work that Zach does. Um, and, and, you know, helping to try to get answers and keep tabs on the, on the population. Um, so anybody who can uh, help out with those surveys, it's greatly appreciated. For sure. So I, I'd like to share, if you don't mind, just uh, quickly on how somebody can find those surveys. So you can get them online, fw.ky.gov, and, um, and then you can go directly to the search engine and search for brood surveys, or I'll navigate to it here, uh, go to our hunting tab, and then scroll to spring turkey hunting. And then if you'll scroll to the very bottom of the page, we'll cover a lot of this resources here in a little bit, but I, I wanted to point this out. The very bottom is we need your help. And it has the data sheets, the paper, how to download it, the instructions on what to do and how to submit them. So it's all right there at your fingertips if you're interested in being a participant in these uh, surveys for us. Hey, Gabe, uh, while we still got Zach up, uh, we have a question. Um, I think this was on the cicada map. If, um, if, it's, if it's not too much trouble, could you go back to the cicada map? Uh, uh, Aaron Farrell. Was interested in that. Would like oh, to. Oh man, you're putting the pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can get to it at the end. I no think rush. I deleted that one, so let me. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to it at the end. I've All right. Close the presentation out. I had too many screens going on. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. So, okay. um, go ahead, Zach. I, I maybe if I still have it, I could. No, I don't have it open either, Gabe. Okay. Right. Yeah, we'll come back to it in the at, towards the end of the Q and A. So, okay. Zach, that was great information. Um, we'll, uh, we'll kind of hit pause and we appreciate all your, all your work and effort. Um, we'll let you go for this point and bring you back here in a little bit. Um, so we'll bring on Sergeant Dolan and we're going to talk, uh, turkey, turkey hunting techniques and safety and some things that, that Brian sees in the field, um, common mistakes turkey hunters, uh, have sometimes. So, uh, Sergeant Dolan, welcome back, sir. Thank you. Glad to be back. Uh, just want to say Zach did an awesome job. That's very useful and helpful information right there. Um, 
First thing I want to talk about it is, uh, like you said, we'll cover uh, a wide variety of stuff, but um, I'm just going to start off simple, you know, season dates. Um, occasionally we do have people that like to, you know, extend season an extra day because they just didn't check the date. So uh, um, turkey season, which we've already had a use season, which was April 3rd and 4th. Uh, the regular turkey spring season is April 17th through uh, May 9th okay. um, in Kentucky. Uh, in, in order to turkey hunt in Kentucky, you have to be, unless you're licensed and permit exempt, uh, you have to have an annual hunting license and a spring turkey permit. Um, you know, as far as our licensing, you know, they we offer several different licenses that you can buy, whether it's an annual, a sportsman, a youth, uh, and there are several different age groups that qualify for certain licenses. So I'll just kind of go into those a little bit. Um, if if you were under a child, under the age of 12, you are licensed and permit exempt, so you are not required to have it. Uh, you are also um, under the age 12, not really required to obtain hunter education yet. You can start taking that at the age nine, but it's really not mandated until you start having to buy a purchase license. Uh, talking about hunter ed as well, you know, if you're born on or, or after January 1st, 1975, you know, you need to complete your hunter ed, hunter um, education completion uh, card and you'll obtain the, it's called an orange card. It's what uh, everybody's referred to. <clears throat> but I'm going um, to interrupt you here for a second. Brian. Yeah, Let's I'm right talk. Let's talk hunter ed. So, you know, a lot of folks are familiar with that process. You go to an all-day course and you go to a range. So now, uh, due to COVID, we offer that in a little bit different format as mm -hmm. well. So we're still suspended on offering those in-person courses. However, now you have that ability at your fingertips. So there's a free online course that you can take through the NRA. It takes about eight hours, six to eight hours to complete that. You would then complete that course and then um, a participant can also do a, a video submission of their range day. So our Hunter Ed requires two parts, the actual course and then also um, uh, a video or, or a range day participation. So now you can have a, a Hunter Ed certified instructor, a Hunter Ed a certified individual take you to a range uh, and then video yourself and then upload that and that can meet the requirements. So for you folks that are new uh, to hunting and want to try to get your hunter ed, you can do that. And then we'll also got a plug. We have a one year hunter ed exemption. Um, traditionally, that, there's been a fee to that. We've, we've also waived that fee uh, because of COVID. So if you've never um, taken hunter ed and you're interested in hunting and you're not sure you've got enough time to complete that course, you can go get a one year hunter ed exemption, ask you a few simple questions, but you can get that uh on, on our website, pretty much on demand at any point. So I had to, had to plug that for no, a you're, second, you're Brian. Fine. It's you. actually a good reference. Uh, I know they've been talking about going online for the last couple of years, and due to COVID, it just kind of forced us to. Um, I personally, I think it's a good thing. I've got a lot of good feedback from the general public on it. Um, so hopefully we can continue to, to do that as well. Um, as far as uh, licensing, you know, if you're – age 12 to 15, uh, you qualify for a youth license. Um, so you can get the youth uh, annual hunting, and then you can also get a, uh, for spring turkey, you can get a youth uh, turkey permit, which covers just one bird, whether you choose to it to be spring or fall, you're allowed only one bird. Um, if you're 16 through the age 64, you qualify for the annual hunting license. Um, you know, the spring turkey permit, which covers two birds. And then you're allowed, uh, you can qualify for the uh, youth sport, uh, the sportsman, which youth also have a sportsman license as well. Um, the youth sportsman, it covers two birds on it. And then the, uh, the uh, adult 16 to 64 covers the uh, um, spring or fall turkey permits. So it, it covers both birds on those. And then on the, uh, if you're age uh, 65 or older, or you are disabled, you qualify for a senior disabled license, which is a discounted license. 
Um, and it's pretty much – it covers a little bit more than what a sportsman's license does, but in all reality, it's pretty much the, the same as a sportsman's license. So we and, have uh, – I was going to say, we have a lot of licenses and bundles and options depending on who you are and how old you are and if you own land or not own land. And I think the biggest thing is uh, visit our website, and I can pull this up real quick um, since we're, we're talking about that, uh, Brian. So if you go to our spring turkey hunting page, mm -hmm. um, we have all the different rules and regulations, plus we have a, a hunting summary guide uh, that's out at all your sportsmen's uh, and uh, places you buy hunting and fishing licenses. Um, but, you know, at, on this page, we have the hunting dates and then a list of all the different licenses and permits. And then you can kind of review that to see what category you fit and use that to inform you on what purchases you need to make before you go turkey hunting. Exactly. Um, as far as talking about licenses, one of the common mistakes we run across is, you know, uh, especially people that just don't read into the regulations is, is they'll buy instead of the annual license, they'll buy a one day or seven day license. And for turkeys, that license, a hunting license is not, uh, does not qualify. You have to purchase an annual hunting license um, if you're gonna hurt, hunt, hunt spring birds, uh, well, just hunt uh, turkeys in Kentucky. Um, another thing too is, is we run across a lot of people that just don't keep up with the dates and so they they think they've bought their license but when you check them out in the field they haven't or always you know a lot of people buy license at Walmart when you go to Walmart buy your license always look at your license before you leave there because you, you know the people that sell you the license are human too you know humans make mistakes so they may have sold you the wrong license. You know, verify it before you leave the store with it. Um, it's actually your responsibility to. Uh, when you're in the field, you need to keep your license on your person. Same with the hunter ed. You know, if you qualify for hunter education card, you need to keep that on your person as well because if you get checked, you will be asked for it. Um, as far as hunting if you are a successful hunter you know if you do kill a bird uh you need to um, um well when you get your license it'll have a harvest log on it and you need to complete your harvest log before you actually move the carcass um right after harvesting your bird um we run into a lot of people in the field that that fail to do that they get excited yeah. or they um uh, you know just don't have ink pen on them, left it in the vehicle or something like that. Um, you know, there's other ways as far as to, to mark a harvest log. If you're licensed and permit exempt, you don't have a harvest log. So you've got to be creative on, on uh, you know, how to make a harvest log. With me, a lot of times, especially with today's technology, we use cell phones. And, uh, you know, your cell phones have got notes on them and, and stuff like that. So a lot of times I'll I'll open my notes on my cell phone and I'll mark my harvest log that way. And then once I telecheck it, you know, that information will automatically go over to my harvest log and I'll print a new one. That's how I personally do it. But, uh, you know, everyone has their own method and way they do things. I know. <clears throat> as far as on the harvest log, once you kill a turkey, um, you know, questions it's going to ask on there is the date you harvested your bird what the species of the bird is, the sex of the bird. And um, then it'll ask for what county you're in, you harvest your animal in, and then a confirmation number, uh, which you obtain by telechecking your bird. So I, I know, think I was, I was gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you too. <laughs> Sorry, I keep interrupting you, but- No, you're fine. It's, it's good material. I was also gonna plug, uh, so we as an agency are gonna be putting out a video here in the next couple of days that kind of goes over turkey harvest and telechecking and what that looks like. Uh, so we, we explain it, we have it in our guide, we have it on our webpage, and then we're also gonna have a video that we'll launch on our social media channels and YouTube on kind of that practice and how what it works. I mean, we also, we telecheck turkeys, but we telecheck a lot of other games. So it's just important that any big game that you harvest, you gotta make sure that you check that animal. And, and, and how, what's our time frame on that one, uh, Brian, on how fast we gotta check them? As far as, uh... For telecheck, you have till uh, midnight of the day you recover it. 
or if you're going to before you process the animal, you know, uh, um, a lot of people they like getting them home pretty quick and breasting them out. But yeah. really, you need to tell check that bird before you uh, do any processing at all. Okay. So let's let's segue a little bit into turkey hunting safety. You know, if, for our deer hunters, especially our firearms hunters, you know, they got to wear hunter orange. You know, turkeys, turkey hunting, and you're fully camoed, sneaking around, making turkey noises. Um, what do you see? Any recommendations uh, to to hunters to make it safe? Um, just some overall things that, that you recommend as an officer in the field and and working some of these cases. Uh, yeah, as far as uh, the number one thing for me is you know firearm safety. You know, um, you know a lot of people that hunt with firearms. You know, you need to be aware if that firearm is loaded at all times, you know, and treat a gun as if it is loaded at all times, you know, be, uh, have awareness of your muzzle. You know, a lot of hunters I check, you know, it's fun to hunt by yourself, but it's even more fun to hunt with somebody. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of hunters I actually check, they're with other people and, uh, which increases the odds of, uh, you know, danger and you need to be extra precautious and, and uh, definitely take safety into consideration then. Um, you know, turkey hunting, it's it's not like deer hunting, you know, you just sit and wait. I mean, some turkey hunters sit in a blind and just wait for a bird, but uh, for me and a lot of hunters I know, you know, we're the type run and gun. And so there's a lot of crossing fences and and uh, going through brush and, and all that. So, you know, make sure you are aware uh, of your muzzle, you know, and if you are going to cross a fence or something, you know, unload that gun. It don't take just a second. Unload it, put them shoves in your pocket, and once you get across, you know, load it back up. It's not that important that it, you know, to risk your life. <clears throat> and then if you do stumble or fall, you can't control which way that barrel's going to fall. And uh, I mean, it, it's hunting incidents are, are, are very, um, tragic and uh, no one no officer i know enjoys going and working with something like that yeah. uh as far as another thing you know uh, a lot of people you know they stock turkeys uh another you know as far i think they call it reaping now it's uh fanning birds it's getting to be really popular um you know it seems like every time i log into youtube or something you know there's some kind of turkey hunting video where somebody's fanning birds in um so it's fun, but it's also dangerous. You know, you're simulating yourself as a turkey and some hunters at a distance, you know, they, they may think you're a real turkey. And so when you do that, you know, you're kind of, you're putting yourself at risk. <clears throat> um, you know, avoid colors, uh, bright colors like red and white, blue, um, you know, even black. Uh, you know, those are colors of a turkey, you know, and so if you are out walking in the field or something like that and you've got those colors, you know, somebody may uh, think you're a turkey um, because really when we're walking in the, in the woods and leaves crackling and whatever, I mean, it doesn't sound much different than a turkey walking or a deer walking, you know, um, try to avoid those colors. And if you harvest a bird, I mean, they make these carry bags now you stick your turkey in they'll be fluorescent orange or camouflage or or whatever the color may be you know the try to hide your bird instead of just throwing it over your bag uh over your back and just packing it out um you know uh, positioning is a, another important thing you know position yourself when you're you're setting up um to actually call in a bird um because you know especially if you hunt public land, if you hear that bird and somebody's close to you, they're probably hearing it as well. So there can be two hunters working the same bird. And, and if one of them sneaking in on him, trying to get closer, he may come up on you and get between you and the bird. You don't know. So try to position yourself on behind trees or big rocks that cover basically all of your torso and head. Um, and make sure you got a good line of sight, at least 180 degrees. Um, I, I'm going to jump in real quick. I, I'm, this yeah. question is just, uh, it's kind of off, off topic a little bit, but 
for a conservation officer, you know, we talk about turkey hunters being, obviously a turkey hunter is going to be in full camouflage. I mean, mm-hmm. their face is going to be covered, their head is going to be covered. What, what is that like? Um, and, and if, if, um, if a hunter encounters a conservation officer, or, and uh, how should they behave? You know, particularly you're all, cam- you know, you're, you're in camouflage and officers out there. How should you behave? You know, what, what should you do? Okay. So uh, as far as on a conservation officer end, um, it, it can be a little nerving, you know, approaching a, a camouflage hunter. Because with us, you don't know who you're approaching. Is it, you know, just an honestly law-abiding citizen or is it somebody that's, you know, uh, violated the law several times or just got in violating law or is it a convicted felon in possession of a firearm that's fixed and go to prison? You don't know who you're approaching. So with us, you know, when we do approach people, a lot of us are on high alert. You know, we try to treat each situation as if, you know, I like going home to my family or not. So I'm going to be alert and I'm going to be professional and do my job to where I do go home to my family at night. So, um, you know, as far as on the hunter end, you know, just listen to the officer's commands. You know, if he tells you to do something, you do it. You don't question it. You just do what he asks. Uh, if he says, lay your gun down, lay your gun down, you know, um, we're, we're people too. You know, we, we just have a job to do. So most of us, we try to be courteous and, and, uh, you know, treat everyone with respect until they violate that. So as long as you just uh, do what the officer asks, and uh, if he asks for your license, you know, don't give any grief about it. Try to make it a, a, a very smooth selling conversation. And, and uh, the smoother it goes, the quicker it'll go. And it'll be out of your hair and you can go back to hunting. So I, I hope that answered that question. It did. Thank you. It was just um, something that, they came to mind. I've been out with with an officer before during deer season, and this was really struck by um, you know what it's like to encounter another hunter um, who's camouflaged, and mm-hmm. you're 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 prone to encounter a, a hunter who's even more camouflaged during spring turkey season. So. Exactly. You know, deer season with the uh, fluorescent orange, you know, people stick out pretty good, but mm-hmm. uh, turkey season, I mean, they're they're harder to find. Um, and that's another thing too, you know, a lot of people use hunting blinds now and stuff and and I cannot see inside a blind. So it, it makes it very dangerous when you're approaching a blind, not knowing who's in or, I mean, for all I know, I mean, they may have a gun barrel pointed at me, I don't know. Um, so typically what I do is I normally call people out of, out of the blind, you know, I don't get I'll find myself some cover and I'll holler at them to where they can hear me and, and I'll call them out, tell them to leave their farms in the, in the blind and I'll call them out and then I'll check them outside. Um, I'm not going to put myself at risk and, and approach your blind uh, when I can't see inside of it. Any other questions? I think we're uh, think we're good at this point. Okay. So I, I appreciate the information, and uh, I think let's what we'll do is we'll bring Zach back on, and let's just kind of talk talk turkey hunting. I mean, I know all four of us are passionate turkey hunters and uh, enjoy getting out and chasing turkeys. And I just kind of like to hear uh, from any of you guys what your tactics are. Like, what do you do? You like to be aggressive? Do you like to call a lot? You call on the roost and then get quiet? So Somebody just kind of give me their their expertise and their their efforts to try to harvest one of these one of these turkeys. <laughs> I'm here to learn, so guys, come on. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's how all turkey hunters are. <laughs> I've got patience. I, my dad taught me to have patience. You know, uh, we grew up hunting together, and he got me into it. And and uh, I, some of the buddies I hunt with, they said I have a lot more patience than what they had. I, I don't care to sit and wait on a bird till two o'clock in the afternoon. You know, I'll, I'll stick with the same bird, but you know, some people I hunt with, you know, if uh, he's not gobbling, he's not coming. And uh, I just don't believe that. I know I was personally a little late to get started in turkey hunting. I, I feel like, and uh, a friend of mine really fostered me personally and he gave me some good advice and I've tried to pass that on is, 
when you're ready to get up and leave, wait five minutes. Is I don't know how many times early on I was, oh, he's, you know, turkey stopped gobbling. I'm out of here. I'm going to go find something else. And I get up and then you see it running away or you hear it fly exactly. off and you're like, oh, if I'd have just waited. And uh, that has been uh, sometimes a hard rule for me, but I try to enact it because overall it's paid off more than it's hurt me. Exactly. Zach, you and I did a story a couple of years ago for Kentucky Field Magazine about what you carry in your turkey vest. So maybe just tell tell the viewers, you know, some of the things that, that you like to pack. I know everybody's everybody carries something different in their vest, you know, you know right. and it just kind of runs the gamut. So what are some things that, that you have to have with you? Yeah, well, so call us. Uh, used to when I would try to take every call I had or usually I was stealing my dad's calls honestly <laughs> I would uh, I would lose strikers and you know I'd have a box call it would squawk as I took a step because I didn't have you know the rubber band broke or whatever on it and so ultimately that all just got me to will down I, I don't go without a, a mouth call I just happen to like diaphragms I'm not a pro at it I, I'm not a champion caller but I can sound decent and I think most people probably can, but I like to bow hunt and I, I'm, I, you know, I'll kill one turkey with a bow in my life, but I'm starting to go more recently. Part of the reason I don't is because I don't like to sit still in a blind that often. I need to take Brian's advice more and, you know, get a bow hunt and set up that way, but I still like to move around a lot, but, but I like to go light, honestly. And for that story, you know, it was actually my dad's old hunting vest. And since then I've got a new vest that's, nice it's got a nice cushion on it got all kind of pockets but i still lose my strikers i i can't you know <laughs> I, I can't get to my stuff so i try to be as simple as possible and and uh part of that too is because i've started hunting eastern kentucky a little bit and I, you know those mountains are a challenge and uh from grouse hunting i mean i know the lighter the better man so i try to transfer that to turkey hunting too so I got I got to say I know Kevin thinks about this and we talk about a turkey hunting uh, setup, but preparedness going in, you know, we're sitting around on the grass, you know, you know, sitting on the ground. Something we all need to be cognizant of as ticks and thinking about uh, putting down permethrin, putting down some sort of off on your on your clothing to help protect yourself from ticks and any potential diseases they carry. So we want everybody to have fun and recreate safely, but also. Be aware of that before you go afield. Uh, take some water, especially right now in spring. It can be super cold when you first start and then be 80 degrees by noon. So, you know, we think about our calls and our gear and our ammo, but also thinking about, you know, tick prevention, water, hydration, and then first aid. You know, it's, it's crazy not to throw a, a small first aid kit and you slice your finger or slip and fall. Uh, and that's just good practice no matter what you're doing when you're afield. Let people know where you're going to be. That's another one mm -hmm. for sure right so, so brian tell me about uh what's your your go-to call what do you what's are you uh diaphragm turkey call what's your uh, i'm diaphragm all the way i i normally don't pack anything else with me uh maybe a crow call and a hawk call and that's about it to get them shot gobble but i'm straight up diaphragm you know i, I know for me picking up the diaphragm scared me to death like thinking I'm, <laughs> you know, scare the turkeys and you know call wrong but after I started hunting for a while I realized that you know so many times I was like man that's another hunter but it's not it's turkeys are very vocal and they mm -hmm. don't ever sound the same they're I mean they one exactly. can be super raspy or almost a horse horse sounding and or some of it be just crystal clear you swear that's a professional hunter but it's a turkey so don't be uh don't be nervous to try it. And, uh, you know, I know for myself this, this, this weekend with youth, I took my daughter and I gave her a, a box call and said, go at it. And she was all afraid about it. And I'm like, it's not going to hurt anything. Like, listen to them. And she could hear the, the hens calling and the gobblers in the trees. And it's just, you know, part of learning. So she was nervous about it. But after she heard what she heard, she's like, okay, I, I see what we're doing here. Gabe, it's a, you bring up a really good point here, and we've talked. It's it's been brought up before in our conversation tonight, but just <clears throat> the importance of, of taking others hunting, um, because somebody took us, and uh, 
you know, you know, whether Zach, it was your dad, you know, Brian, it was your dad, you know, it, it could be, you know, I got into it late, um, you know, into my late thirties, um, and had an adult, you know, a couple, you know, adult hunters, you know, offered to take me and, you know, I, I just had a blast. And, and one of the things is, you know, and Zach, you mentioned this earlier is that a successful hunt isn't always about harvesting a turkey that, <clears throat> speaking from personal experience, a successful hunt for me as a new turkey hunter could be finding, you know, scouting an area, getting there and hearing the birds and gobble. If you've never heard of a you know, wild turkey gobble in the, in the woods before, that's a success. Getting one to respond to your calls, another success. And then getting them to come in, you know, just those things alone. That's what makes this opportunity so special um in the state and so much fun <laughs> i mean i just i look forward to to mid-april um it's one of my favorite times of year and i know you all feel the same uh as well so um you know does everybody have their spot picked out you know uh, for for opening morning i, I, know I do yep although yeah. yeah yeah i do i, I always doubt i'll be really worried about it Kind of, kind of. <laughs> what'd you say brian i didn't catch it i said i'll be working but as soon as i get a day off i, I know where i'm going <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I understand. there's the there's one thing I, I wanted to cover as we as we wrap up here and and brian alluded to it and but i want to expand upon it a little bit if we can so you know we talked about how we mimic turkeys and the way we we act in the decoys and how important it is to know your target but it's also just as important to be knowing the distance from the, your target. So there's been a lot of development in ammunition and thinking about making you sure the right ammunition. And I know Zach, you and I have talked about this. Uh, talk to him about talk to me if you don't mind, Zach, on knowing that distance and and you know what what we've seen through research and and uh, turkeys and, and shot placement. Yeah, tremendous technological advances and. You know, I'm, I'm all about people taking advantage of that, particularly if it means a quicker, cleaner, more humane kill. But it won't mean that unless you also be careful about that distance yardage. This new technology with these shot shells don't mean you can extend and extend. I read a, an article recently, I think it was in WTF Magazine. It was a good one. It said, have a 60-yard gun for a 40-yard shot and uh, set up. And what that means, his point was, you know, get the new shells, get the, get the chokes, but shoot those things and limit yourself. And, and within your limit, know that distance, you know, everybody can judge it. But if you have a reasonable distance, and I, I still like 40 yards as an absolute max myself, you know, from Tim Farmer saying it on Kentucky Field when I was growing up, to, to just common sense, it's easy to misjudge. And if you shoot and miss a turkey, most birds you miss aren't missed. They're hit. And they're probably not going to make it. They won't die right then. They're going to die somewhere else. And so it's just important with conservation to know your distance. Practice, practice. It's part of being a good woodsman, you know, along with being safe. So that's that's my feel about it. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to make sure we, we covered that. Um, so... So briefly, if we can, we've got a few questions. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll answer those real quickly. Um, first question is, is it legal to shoot a turkey when it's flying or when it's roosted? No, it is not. As far as the flying, there's uh, roosting. There is a law that you cannot shoot a bird from the roost. As far as flying, uh, we currently do not have a law against that, but it's really not an ethical shot. You know, you... You should be an ethical hunter, like Zach was saying. You know, know your limits. Um, a turkey, you know, if you're using a shotgun, you want to hit it in the head, you know, for the most humane and, and the most, you know, quick kill possible. And so to try to hit that object in the air uh, is highly difficult. Um, so as far as being ethical, it's really not, in my opinion. I don't know how you all feel about it. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to know your target, and that's, you know, you're shooting a really tight pattern and trying to hit a large, you know, small and a large target, but it's really not really when you look at your pattern. So, 
you know, it's, it's definitely not a shot you should be taking. Uh, Brian, we'll stick with you on this next one. Um, uh, this uh, individual was born in 1989, so he's 31 right now. He wants to know, does he have to keep his Hunter Ed card on him, uh, or is it only if he has to keep it on him if he's under 18? Uh, law says it has to be on him, okay. on his person, while in the field hunting, same as his hunting license. So, uh, of course, every, every officer uses discretion on certain things. I can't tell you what you know, the next officer would do. So uh, the only uh, only advice I can give is exactly what the law says. Okay. I know uh, we, we discussed this earlier. I said I'd come back. So we had a, a viewer that wanted to look at that cicada map. So let me pull that up real quick and uh, see that. So that's the cicada map. And this is, uh, Zach, was this from the Forest Service or from UK or you know where you uh, got this map for somebody that could go look at it if they wanted to at their own pleasure? I have a, I actually was sent this from my counterpart biologist over in Indiana uh, for a while ago. It's actually from a PDF. And if you give me just a second, I can find the, uh, I, I could find the URL to it. Uh, but I, I did do a screenshot for it. But I, uh -huh. I think that publication took this map from apparently from the Forest Service. But I'm uh, happy to share it with that individual or if you can flash it on the screen or whatever. Uh, and I will also say, so we have a, in the upcoming article of Kentucky Field Magazine, we will be talking about uh, the cicada, uh, this right. cicada brood and where it looks like. So if you're not a subscriber of our Kentucky Field Magazine, we encourage you to subscribe and uh, see all the great content that we put out there. All right, and then uh, last question. Uh, this probably will be back for you, Brian. Um, wants to know if it's legal to take a hen uh, during the spring with a bow. Um, so the way our reg is on bag limit is you're allowed one male bird or one turkey with a visible uh, beard per day. Um, so if that turkey is a hen, I mean, it's perfectly legal as long as it has a visible beard. Um, that's another thing I want to note is, you know, as far as a common mistake, you know, some of the violations we run across is, you know, where people harvest a bird without actually laying eyes on a visible beard. Um, so they'll just, you know, how turkeys do. They never come in the way you want them to. And so they'll come in and all they got is just a head shot. And after they take the shot and they go down there and they see what they've harvested, it's not what they wanted or not an actual legal bird. So um always know 100 percent what you're shooting at and um which also leads into you know where you know they don't look beyond where their target is to see what's back behind it and that's how you end up with people that harvest two birds in one day last the last thing from here for me that i'd like to share is so uh if you've, if you've watched our episodes before we talk a lot about the different resources that are available online so we actually have a new learn to turkey hunt page that's just been out for maybe a week. Um, and just so if you're new to turkey hunting or you're still learning, trying to get some basics, um, we have that now on our website under the turkey hunting page. Uh, you can go to our website, type learn to turkey hunt or navigate that through on the hunting section. Um, and it has a variety of different things uh, for the novice or new hunter, uh, as far as just biology and basics, videos, on explaining that identification of a gobbler versus a hen. Uh, we also have a nice sponsorship package with us in Academy Sports uh, with some get outside and some things that you should purchase uh, and recommendations uh, to go turkey hunting for all the different gear, uh, shotgun placement and patterning um, and with videos explaining how that all works, uh, scouting tips, camouflage and the importance of that, how to set up um, stalking and calling. We kind of went over a lot of these things. If we were over your head, come in here and take a look at this. We see a variety of different resources from lots of different experts explaining that. And then ultimately, if you're successful, how to clean and how to cook uh, as you harvest your first game, it can be a little intimidating. Uh, now you've got a harvested animal. How do I break it down and be able to, to cook it? And then also a fantastic group of recipes for uh, turkeys and uh, recommendations from a lot of different experts. So I uh, just wanted to share that with the group real quick. 
great resources there too. I mean, I gotta say it's a pretty neat compendium of stuff. And uh, Gabe, right. the fellow I just sent you, uh, I, I don't know if you can do it. If people want to do a Google search, they can simply search Brood X Cicada USDA 2021. Okay. That will get you that map that uh, you'll find links there to that map I showed. Uh, also sent you a PDF, but I don't know if you can really share that or uh, whatever. It's, uh, it's easy to find. I, I would, if you're interested in it, it's really easy to find. There's tons of good information on the periodic skaters online. Uh, UK Entomology has a good site too. Yeah, if I could uh, edit this, so I'll put that link in the uh, in the chat for everybody. Oh. <laughs> or maybe Gabe did. I did, but I, I I get it right here. Kevin's got it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, first off, thank you. Um, thank you for all that you do for the sportsmen and women of Kentucky and the resources. A lot of goes into it, whether it's the management or the enforcement. Um, we appreciate your passion for the resource and uh, picking your brain. And, and lastly, sharing this time with us this evening. I know you're very busy uh, and you have families to tend to. And, and we really appreciate you coming on and, and chatting with us tonight. And uh, we will see you guys soon. And thank you for all that you do. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Brian. All the other COs. And thanks to the sportsmen who fund conservation. Yep. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. So, Kevin, we've kind of talked about a variety of stuff. Um, really just wanted to, to plug a few more opportunities and some things about turkey hunting as I wrap up. Um, you know, we also have a promotion of strutting in the bluegrass. This is a semi live uh, uh, event that we hold on our social media channels through YouTube and Facebook. Uh, if, if you are a subscriber of any of those, you've seen a few of those videos. We're going uh, live on the next couple of days. Our next live event is April the 10th. And then the first seven days of modern gun or of the spring turkey season, there'll be um, mid-morning live kind of talking about what's going on they'll actually be in the field uh, showing some videos and, and seeing what they're experiencing as they kind of bounce around the state uh, so if you're interested in that you can check that out um, you know I showed some stuff online that's available some other things to think about on our YouTube channel we actually have a Kentucky turkey hunting playlist so a variety of things that we have done as an agency that talk about turkey hunting um, in there are our um our hunter recruitment branch just finished a turkey webinar series in the whole month of March. And all those webinars are there. You can watch, go back and watch on demand. They cover all kinds of topics about turkey hunting, fantastic resource. And then um, we also will air on KET this weekend, our Kentucky Field call-in show uh, where they talk about turkeys. And you'll see Mr. Danks again in that enforcement where we're taking questions from, from folks uh, regarding turkey and turkey hunting. So a lot of stuff available online for you to look at on our, on our web pages uh, to, to help you inform you and um, make you a better turkey hunter. When we think back to how we started this conversation and, and when Zach came on, he, he went back to the 40s and, and the 50s and then the restoration. And then fast forwarding to today and some of these resources that are available uh, you know, just at the, the tips of your fingertips uh, online. It's incredible. I mean, if you want to learn, you know, there are people out there who are willing to help. There are tons of resources. You know, if you're a new hunter, you know, watching videos about how to call is a, is a great way to learn uh, and asking, you know, asking questions. And, and it's just, uh, it's remarkable how far things have come. <laughs> I mean, and here we are talking about this on a yeah. you know, on a virtual platform, so. And you know, and, and that's a good way for us to plug in the good old fashioned way, still pick up the phone and call. You know, we have an info information center that you can call from eight to 4.30 Eastern. That's 800-858-1549. They can answer a lot of your questions. If they're not able, we will get you to the subject professional that can help you. That, I mean, we talk turkeys, but that goes with anything that Fish and Wildlife does. Uh, we are here and available. You'll talk to a person and uh, be able to interact with them and we'll do the very best we can to, to help inform you and get the answers that you're looking for. So you know, I guess for me wrapping up, let's think turkeys and you know, make sure you purchase that, uh, that hunting, hunting license and turkey permit before you go afield. And um, we'll, uh, we'll be here soon. Kevin, let's wrap it up, sir.
Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, for everybody who, uh, who was watching tonight, we really appreciate, uh, appreciate you spending your evening with us. Uh, I know your time is valuable and, and there are a lot of things that you could be doing. So uh, we're very honored that, uh, that you chose to spend, uh, spend this time with us. So uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you haven't done, uh, gone ahead and done so, uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button uh, at the top right corner of the YouTube page and then select the bell uh, right there and uh, to receive all notifications of new content from the Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. So um, we are going to be back uh, April 22nd for another uh, conservation conversation and uh, look forward to it. And uh, Gabe, I guess we'll see you then. Yep, sounds good. Thank you, Kevin. Good all night. Right. Have a good evening.